All right. So, hello. Uh, my name is Lindsay Cooper, and I am a PhD student in the Programming Languages group at Indiana University, and I'm also an intern on the REST team here at Missoula Research. And I'm going to be telling you about my work on the REST type class system and the work I've done extending the type class system to a trait system. So when I started this project, I didn't really know what type classes or traits were, and I suspect that some of us are in the same situation. So what I'm going to do in this talk is cover both of those notions, and then we'll take a look at how they manifest in Rust. So first of all, a few words about Rust. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with Rust, which this room I see in the audience is mostly Rust interns and full-timers, but <laughs> um, hopefully there are some people listening who aren't. So Rust is a new systems programming language that Mozilla is working on, and it has the goals of safety, concurrency, and speed, uh, more or less in that order, depending on who you ask. And uh, this is a haiku that we came up with a while ago that more or less summarizes the goals of Rust. And if I were to describe what programming in Rust feels like to me, I would say it feels kind of like C would feel if it had strong typing, pattern matching, type inference, and a lot of features that encourage modularity and higher order programming. And you'll see some of what I mean by that in a minute, but all that's really kind of just the beginning. And there will be more talks from the other interns in the coming days about some of the other parts of the language. But the part I'm going to talk about is one of those modularity encouraging features, which is the type class system. So first of all, what are type classes? So type classes are an idea that, as far as I know, originally came from Haskell. And the bog standard example that everyone always uses to explain type classes is uh, what's called an EQ, <coughs> equality type class. So what I'm going to do here is show some code in Rust and explain it, and then we'll see how it looks in comparison to Haskell. So Rust has had a, a basic type class system since the 0.1 release, which came out in January. And this code that I'm going to show here runs under 0.3, which is the most recent release. <coughs> and it also runs against the head of the tree, modulus and syntax changes. And if you want to see what it looks like with those changes, it's in our test suite on GitHub, and I can point you to that later. Um, so Rust, as of when I showed up this spring, an interface, an iface, uh, was just a co collection of method signatures. So what we have here is an interface called equal, and uh, it has an is eq method. I'm sorry, this is small. Uh, that we apply to some value and uh, some other argument. And we get back a Boolean value telling us if they're equal. So uh, we also have an implementation of the equal I face here. So I have an enum type uh, called color uh, with four variants, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And uh, if we want to implement is eq for that type to see if two things are the same, you just check that they're the same variant. Uh, and incidentally, this shows off how pattern matching works in Rust. Um, so perhaps more interestingly, uh, we can also define another type, a uh, color tree that's the type of binary trees of colors. And, and then to write is eq for color trees, well, if they're both leaves, then we call is eq on the colors of the leaves. And if they're both branches, then we call is eq on the subtrees. And uh, in the, the implementation of, of the equal interface for color tree, notice that uh, Although, like, we're making three calls to the isEq uh, method, they aren't all the same method. Uh, the x dot is eq y is, uh, is a call to the one that we have implemented earlier, and the other two are recursive calls. Um, so the isEq method is essentially being statically overloaded. Um, and then, uh, finally, there's a case at the bottom where if, if we have a leaf and a branch, or a branch and a leaf that we're trying to compare, well, clearly those two are not equal. So in that case, we can just return false. And uh, here are a bunch of examples of calls to is eq. So I said I was going to compare this code to Haskell. So let's take a look at how similar they are. Uh, so in Haskell, you could write, uh, using the class keyword, uh, you could write what's called a type class. And here we have a type class uh, with an is eq method uh, we have an, an enum data type called color, and we have uh, an implementation of the equal type class. Looks a lot like Rust, and then similarly we can do the same for the color tree type. Um, and in fact, these will look even more similar in the rest of today, because uh, I think just as of yesterday, uh, you can have uh, so-called static methods in Rust. Uh, 
which means that you could call them in something that looks more like is eq x comma y instead of the x dot is eq of y that we have here. Oh, so okay, so this is all fine and good, um, but none of the code that we've written so far really takes advantage of what I think is one of the most awesome things about type classes, uh, which is the following. So once you've gone and defined is eq for these different types, well, what we ought to be able to do now is have other methods that are defined in terms of the ones that we already defined. So let's see how that looks. Uh, so in Haskell, if you have a type class that has an isEQ method, then it seems pretty reasonable that you might want to have an is not eq method also. Um, and the cool thing is that in the Haskell code, um, if we've also implemented isEQ for a bunch of types, then you kind of get an is not eq method almost for free. And you just throw what's called a default implementation into the type class, like this. So is not eq is just defined in terms of is eq. And now we can use is not eq on things of type color or things of type color tree, even though we didn't have to go and implement it for either of those. Uh, but the thing that I just did in Haskell, uh, this has not been possible in Rust up until now. So what I have been working on is making it possible. Uh, any questions so far? All right. One aside is that you could argue that this would be an inefficient way to uh, implement disequality, and you'd be right. Uh, but there are fancier examples where this would work. Uh, for instance, in, in the REST type inference engine, we have an interface that has something like 12 or 15 methods, and, the, and there are three implementations of this interface, and all three implementations are required to implement all of the methods in the interface, even though most of them are the same in, in two or even all three of the implementations. So we end up with a lot of copy-paste code, and that's never good. Okay, so stepping aside from uh, type classes for a moment, let's look at traits. So when I showed up at Mozilla this summer, I thought I was going to work on implementing an as yet unimplemented piece of the object system called traits. And I'll illustrate this through an example too. So the idea of traits has been around for, I guess, about 10 years. And I'll, I'll give a reference at the end of the talk. Um, but a trait as, at its simplest is just a collection of methods, possibly also fields, and they come in two flavors, uh, provided and required. So here we have some traits uh, written in a hypothetical language that's kind of like Rust. And we have a trait called playful that requires a field, the is tired field, and a method called fetch. And it provides a play method uh, that's implemented in terms of the stuff in the required block. Uh, and this example, by the way, was inspired by Patrick's object system proposal from last November, which you can find on the rest of mailing list. So traits can be, quote unquote, mixed in to classes. And there's actually a subtle difference between traits and so-called mix-ins, but I won't get into that. Um, what to take note of here is that the puppy class derives from both the playful and hungry traits. And the order of those two doesn't matter. Uh, it could derive from those in either order. So we could have said that puppy derives from hungry and then playful. Uh, and that's crucial. Uh, that. Uh, traits uh, are composable and that order doesn't matter. Um, and if there's a conflict between the two, like if they both implement a method with the same name, then one of the design principles of traits is that the conflict has to be explicitly resolved in some way. So when I got here, uh, some parts of Patrick's proposal had been implemented, but traits hadn't been yet. And a lot of people were wishing that we had something like this, uh, because this is a nice way to achieve code reuse. Uh, but we didn't have it yet. Uh, so what ended up happening is around June, uh, we made a, an interesting observation, which is that the provided methods that, uh, that traits have are analogous to the default methods in type classes, and that required methods in traits are analogous to what we had in interfaces already, just methods that are just signatures without a, a default implementation. And we were really excited when we realized this, because we'd been thinking for a while that we were going to implement traits, uh, but we thought that traits and interfaces were different things, or at least they were different things in the previous proposal. And unifying them was great, because uh, not only did it mean less code in the compiler, but it's, it's one fewer thing for our users to have to learn. So uh, the plan became that we were going to add default methods, interfaces would be renamed to traits. It's a very convenient renaming to do, because it's just five characters, so no reindenting required. And uh, that's why the title of, of this talk is Type Classes Turn Traitor. Um, and there are actually three parts to this change. 
There's default methods, which I've been focusing on here, and then also trait composition and implementation coherence. And uh, this talk has just been focusing on default methods, but if you want to learn about the rest, I'm about to show you where to go to learn more. So some references for type classes. Uh, there are a couple of things you can look at. The Haskell tutorial has a nice section on them. Uh, the real world Haskell book has a chapter that I borrowed my color example from here. For traits, the original paper on traits is this 2003 paper called Traits, Composable Units of Behavior. Uh, and, um, and then in terms of bringing traits and type classes together or bringing uh, traits and interfaces together, uh, what you should know about is in Rust, we have some stuff on the development roadmap on our wiki, particularly there's a section called OO System Changes. Uh, there's my proposal, uh, which is currently being implemented and it's in progress. And uh, Patrick did a blog post uh, yesterday called The Gentle Introduction to Traits in Rust, which is pretty good. Uh, and uh, this is on the way. Uh, hopefully we'll have default methods by the end of next week. And we're expecting to see all of this stuff in Rust 0.4. So everything I described is either running code that you can go play with or you'll be able to play with it soon. Uh, I have some stuff in the test suite right now that's code from this talk. And I hope to be done implementing default methods by the time my internship ends next week. So please go try it out. Uh, and uh, before I close, uh, I want to say thanks. I'm, as some of you know, I'm a repeat offender Rust intern. I did this last year too. And uh, there's been a lot of change between this year and last year. I, I think that Rust is more grown up as a language, as you might expect. But one really cool thing is that there's been a huge upswing in community participation. So, like, for instance, last year we had about 40 people in our IRC channel at a given time, and now we have about 100. And people seem to be really excited about traits, and we're constantly fielding questions from people about whether traits are done yet and how they're going to work. And, and that's been really exciting because, you know, I'm from academia. I'm not used to working on things that people actually want. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to everyone on the Rust team, Fultimers interns, but also thanks to everyone who showed up and contributed to this. And we hope you keep contributing, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yes? So the, the traits example, I was wondering, yeah. what would you say are the, the key differences for a, a C++ developer like me between like traits and, say, having classes like that and then implementing puppy as uh, a subclass of a hungry class and a playful class? Okay, so the question was, what's the difference between traits and the kind of code reuse you get from that and the kind of code reuse you get from just, say, standard inheritance in C++? Is that a fair question? Well, okay, a couple of things. Uh, so one, like, C++ in particular uh, uh, is uh, kind of an apropos thing to bring up because Multiple inheritance has its problems, and traits are designed to address some of the problems of multiple inheritance, uh, in particular the dreaded diamond inheritance problem. Uh, and that's what trait composition is supposed to address. And I would really recommend taking a look at the traits paper for that. Um, aside from that, though, uh, I guess traits are interesting because Although they do have a relationship that you might think of as kind of like a, a, a subtyping hierarchy, they aren't types. So the, the kind of reuse you get, like, you have a different component of reuse <coughs> than, than you do with, with uh, subtyping or subclassing. So I, I thought I'd add, there, is, there was a proposal for traits in C++. It was called concepts. Oh, yes, uh, yeah. And there were two competing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a it, good point. It, it didn't make it into C++ 2011, but... Um, yeah, so the concepts proposal in C++ is, uh, uh, was, was dramatically shot down, and uh, concepts uh, are still being discussed. Uh, they're sort of like competing factions, and uh, the only reason I know about this is because one of the competing factions happened to be at my school. So... Uh, um, but I, I don't know too much about the, the concepts proposal, but I, I know that it's not in the language officially. So how, how do traits interact with the type system? 
so do traits interact with the text? What's their, what's their, I mean, you said they're, they're not like classes, so you can't have like a playful type, which acts like an interface, right? Uh, well, so it's not a type. Uh, oh, okay, the question was how do traits interact with the type system? Uh, so so pl playful wouldn't be a type, but uh, you can, uh, looking back at our, uh, at our type classes code here. Um, so... I think it might be more accurate to say it is a type that you can't instantiate. Okay, so Dave comments that it is a type, but not one that can be instantiated. Okay. So does that mean it's an interface? That's one way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, that's what this proposal is all about, unifying interfaces. And I, I guess I just want to see, like, how you would use a puppy which had playful as a okay. trait with encode. You probably want to look at my blog post for okay. that. So basically what you do is you bound a generic. They interact really well with generics. So what you do, so imagine that I have, uh, I want to take uh, anything, I have a function that takes anything that is playful. Um, what I do is I write, so you would, your first try might be something like, uh, to find a function that takes a T and call T.play. And that works in C++, but it doesn't work in Rust because we don't, we type check templates at the time you, you write them, not the time you instantiate them. So, but what you can do is you can say, okay, I take a T and T must be playful. And then I can call .play. So what you can do is you can put these bounds, these restrictions on type parameters, and that's how you can use them. Okay. Cool. So Patrick answered your question. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. To me, uh, traits feel a lot like modules. But is there uh, any way to deal with name collisions? Name collisions. Uh, collisions of methods or method names. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the principles of traits is that any conflicts have to be resolved explicitly. So if you look at the traits paper, uh, there's a mechanism where you can only uh, bring in certain. Uh, methods from a trait uh, and uh, not the others if there's going to be a name collision. And the, the idea here is that um, any conflicts have to be resolved explicitly so you won't run into problems with uh, not necessarily knowing which implementation you're going to be running until runtime. Uh, in Rust right now uh, we don't so right now you would get an error if you tried to compose two traits and they had methods that had the same name. Eventually we would like to have some, well this is up for debate actually, but uh, one thing that we might like to have, I'll put it that way, is some kind of mechanism for fancier conflict resolution. And uh, we'll see if we need it, we'll get there. Um, I guess one thing that comes to mind is that a lot of people write C++ for their whole careers without ever having to do multiple inheritance. So this might be one of those you ain't gonna need it things, but we'll see. We'll, we'll have to find out. Great, other questions? All right, thank you.